the journal article review is done, and that means back to the thesis for you. <laughs> that means hello, this is Ramblings with Rebecca. I'm Rebecca Farnham, and today, International Trade Law. Edge of your seats, people. This is really exciting stuff. International trade law, that branch of international law that deals with the trade between countries. Um, so this is not monetary and fiscal policy. This is really about like the actual goods going back and forth. Um, all of like the currency exchange and that kind of thing fits into the broader branch of international economic law, which international trade law is certainly a part of. Uh, but we're going to focus specifically on international trade law. Probably the biggest name in international trade is the good old WTO, the World Trade Organization, developed in 1995. The WTO is intended to be a framework for administering administering laws, uh, a platform um, for agreeing on those laws and more laws, a place to review policies, and then also um, an institution that can help create better cohesion between member countries. Um, so making sure that you know, the policies within countries aren't hugely divergent or at least aren't so divergent that, you know, you can't regulate the trade in between them. Uh, countries have to sign on to be members of the WTO. Most of them are today. Um, so for the main part, international trade law is WTO law, more or less. Uh, the major principles around WTO and international trade law. Non-discrimination. This means that if a country is in the WTO, it has to be treated the same as all the other countries in the WTO. Uh, this is the idea of the most favored nation treatment. You have to give the member countries in the WTO the best trade agreements um, that you're giving, that, that you would give your favorite other trading partner. Um, mostly around things like tariffs, the taxes that come when goods come into the country. Uh, so all countries in the WTO have to get the same treatment and, you know, be given those same tariffs and that kind of thing. There are, of course, exceptions, because you're probably sitting there going, but wait, <laughs> what about things like the EU? <laughs> uh, so there are exceptions for developing countries and, like, preferential treatments to help developing countries. Um, regional trade-free zones, so, like, the EU, for example, and those kind of things. Um, but for the most part, if you're in the WTO, you get the best agreements that you can get. Uh, that, that, anyway, and that everyone else is getting right. So if you're doing someone a favor, if you're doing country X a favor, you have to do country Y the same favor, unless it fits in, you know, some of the fun exceptions. Um, and then also, as part of non-discrimination, when a good is in your market, you have to treat it the same as your domestic goods. Um, so you can tax French cheese coming into the States, but once it's on the shelf, you can't, like, tax it at a different rate. Um, to like to the individual consumer, for example, than you would a Michigan cheese. Um, more or less, of course, there's lots of nuance there and how they, you know, do and don't tax and these kind of things is what gets really fun. But broadly speaking, no discrimination between foreign and domestically produced goods. Uh, okay, other, so major principle number one is the non-discrimination. Principle two is market access, um, so trying to produce things like tariffs um, and helping there to be a freer flow of goods. Number three, um, balancing that trade liberalization and reducing all the, ba the boundaries and bar uh, barriers um, with other issues in society. This is probably what most often gets protested, <laughs> the WTO, right? I mean, so it's like, what happens when opening up trade, you know, is taking jobs from the marginalized in a community, or is cutting down the rainforest, or is, or is, or is, or is, or is, or is, or is. Um, I would say the WTO generally comes under most fire because it hasn't properly balanced, in the protesters' mind, um, trade liberalization with the other issues that are important to them. And then principle number four is unifying national regulation, so tri property rights, you know, trying to make sure that if it's illegal to copy this DVD in a certain way in the United States, it's illegal to do the same thing in Syria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it, so property rights is just one example of them, but basically, um, yeah, so the rules that govern, you know, what is and what isn't um, a organic food, those kind of things, right? Right. So like doing labeling and national regulation around how things are produced so that that's all the same and it can be compared in an international market. So virtual water. Could paying attention to virtual water mean that suddenly we're messing up most of our nation's status or something? To be continued.